Well, hello and welcome to Crucial Conversations. I'm Peter. And I'm Kevin. And we're doing a special episode answering your questions today because we got some great questions in our YouTube comments on some of our podcast episodes. We've had people emailing us questions and the third option, filling out form the question form on the website. So Kevin, before we get going really quick, they can go to crucialproductions.org slash questions, ask a question, whatever. It's ask a question at the top. There's a button you can click and fill out the form or send an email to questions at crucialproductions.org and or leave a comment on YouTube. If you're watching this or listening to this, if you're watching this, that's really boring because there's just a static image on YouTube. Yeah. If you're listening to it, it's only slightly less boring, right? Is that how that works? Slightly. Well, yeah, we don't. It might be just as boring, but it's not as mind numbing for your eyes. Right. Yeah. And I don't have cat videos I can throw in in the middle of this or anything because I'm that, allergic to cats. Yeah. That's actually the main reason why we don't do that. So there's that. Okay. So that's how these questions got to us. If anybody else has questions they want to get to us, they're also that's how welcome. they can get them to us. They can also walk <laughs> up to us when they see us and ask us. Well, yeah, one of these questions kind of came in that way. And I was like, hey, I'm going to forget that question. Could you email it to us so that I don't forget it? Exactly. Th that was awesome. So, but Kevin, we actually want to say something before we answer these questions. Because we're not their pastors. We're not pastors. So what does that mean that they're asking us questions about theology and stuff? It's good. It means that they're listening and thinking through what they're hearing us say. And that's, and that's a good thing. That's what we want. We, the whole point of this is to help people dive into the scriptures and to think through the church's confession of Christ and to examine our own lives, to see, you know, how, how the word of God shapes us, um, mm -hmm. our faith, our life. And it's good that they that the people are engaging this podcast and, and looking at scripture and, and reading scripture with us and asking questions of us. It's good that they're kind of saying, Hey, you said this, I want to hear more on that. And that's great. <laughs> yep. Right. Yeah. But we also want to make sure that if you have actual spiritual problems or spiritual questions, make sure you're talking to your parish pastor, your local pastor. Yeah. Make sure you're going to him and um, having an appointment with him. And um, another thing is, is make sure you're going to Bible class regularly or congregation. Make sure you're in worship every Sunday without fail. And cause that's really where your spiritual formation is, is hearing the word and the context of your local congregation every Sunday, receiving the Lord's supper. Um, that's, that's really where we are as Christians every, every Sunday without fail. And then also if your congregation offers Bible study, especially with your pastor teaching or somebody who's, who knows what they're talking about, definitely go, go to that and, and learn the word of God in the context of your congregation as well. And mm -hmm. keep listening to us because, you know, <laughs> we talk about scripture and stuff. Yeah. And ask your pastor some of the questions you're asking us too. Not not because you shouldn't be asking us or anything like that, but it's it's always good to talk to the person who is in charge of your spiritual care in that sense and find out what he has to say about it too. In charge of is a weird phrase. We'll get to that. I podcast. know it is. Eventually we're going to have a, have a conversation about that one. Yes. It just kind of came out. I was like, ah, yeah. okay, well, there it was. I said it. Yep. And and we don't edit our episodes. So it's out there. That's there it. it is. That's, that's going to stay. So let's get into our first question. Our first question comes from Adam. It was actually a comment on our non-Lutheran Bible Verses podcast episode. Ooh, fun. That was, that was the title, Non-Lutheran Bible Verses. That, that was a fun one. That was fun. <laughs> so um, basically, let me uh, adjust here. So Adam's question is, how can Lutherans think that we can lose salvation, which we never earned or deserved? Can anyone absent of God through death, life, angels, rulers, powers, or anything else unite themselves to God as children and heirs with Christ? Nope. He's answering that. So who can separate themselves? Can an un unconditional covenant have a conditional way out? 
So a little, little bit of context on this one. We were talking about good works and the Christian life and sanctification and what that means. And we talked about can a Christian lose their salvation? Actually, I don't know if that came up in the episode, but somebody asked a question. So you, with all that you've said in this episode, can do Lutherans believe that we can lose our, lose our salvation? And we sa- And I said, answering, yes, we do believe you can lose it. There's lots of warnings to not walk away from this faith you've been given. And so Adam then asked this question in response to that in the context of the episode as well. So, Kevin, where should we start with this one? Well, I, I, I think we should start with the fact that you can't, which is fun, because you can. <laughs> so you can't, but you can. And can't, but can what? Walk lose away, your salvation. Lose? Okay. You walk away, lose your salvation, whatever. Um, so there's, there's a couple different things going on here that you want to make sure you're keeping in balance. Um, that your balance or tension. Yeah, that's the problem. That's what I was trying to fix. Um, yeah, actually, I was having a technical glitch for a second. Um, <laughs> that you want to keep in tension, and actually, you do want to keep them in balance too. And and that is, you know, are you asking a question of will God stop loving me, or are you asking a question of? Can I, as a sinner, reject God's love, live a sinful life, never avail myself of word and sacrament, and then end up condemned instead of saved even after I've been baptized? So those are two different questions, and you want to make sure you're you're answering and asking the correct one. It's it's kind of that old that kind of the age old tactic of why do you ask? Right. Like so, until I know why you're asking, it's hard to answer one way or the other. That's exactly right. So if somebody comes to you and says, I, I believe in God. I want to believe in God. I'm really struggling with a certain sin in my life, or I'm even struggling with doubt. Um, I just don't know how God could love a sinner like me. Then, then as the question even alludes to, you want to run to Romans eight right? What can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus? And there's a whole list of things. The answer is, well, nothing can. So even our sin is not something that's going to separate us from God's love in Christ. So if, if a terrified conscience is looking for comfort, then you don't point to them as comfort. You always point to Christ and his finished work. Mm-hmm. There, there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God because that love of God is in Christ Jesus and Christ has accomplished that which is necessary for you to be reconciled to God. It's done. You don't need to do anything to complete the work. He's not contingent upon you for God's love to be for you. No, God's love for you is accomplished through the death and resurrection of Jesus. And what Christ has accomplished on the cross has been given to you through the hearing of the word, through baptism, through the Lord's Supper. it That's a gift given. And God doesn't remove his gift. He doesn't say, well, I'm going to give you my gift of love. And then, well, you're kind of rotten. So I guess I shouldn't have given it in the first place. So I'll just take it back. <laughs> he doesn't do that. Um, that's why our hope is always in Christ. Because you say, I mean, I just did this. Yesterday, I went to church and I said in front of the entire congregation that I'm a poor, miserable sinner and I deserve nothing but eternal death. Hey, I did that too. Well, one thing other than eternal death, I also deserve temporal punishment. Ooh, right? Yeah. So, yep. so I said that and, and then I quickly said, but it's because of the mercy of God in Christ Jesus that I'm here asking for forgiveness. See, it's not the depth of my sin or the ability of, of my, my work to be sanctified that determines whether or not God loves me. It's simply the object of work done on the cross by Christ for you. That's what determines God's love. It, it's kind of like we're, we're trying to, well, we're, okay, let me, let me back up a bit. We've, we've phrased it in this way before. When I look at myself, 
and my own actions and my own faithfulness, there's, there's no way I could be saved. It's and, just not, it's just not going to happen. But when I look at Christ and his faithfulness and what he's done, and I trust in that, there's no way I can't be saved. And when we, when we, I find when I end up in this struggle of, okay, so let's think about it in the context of going up to the Lord's supper and, and worthiness. Um, I've had, I've been in a little bit of an online conversation with an individual who's really struggling with worthiness and, you know, am I going up and am I taking this to my judgment? Is this actually going to hurt me because I'm struggling with my sin? I see these sins that I do and that I can't seem to get away from them. Um, am I going to be condemned when I take this? And my, my encouragement or what I hope has been encouragement is stop looking at yourself and how bad you are, which that's, I mean, it's, it's, that is true. This is where we're at. And look at Christ and trust in him. Now, but that's a different thing than saying, I love this sin. I have no intention of stopping it. It's great. And you know what? I'm not even sure it's sin at all. I think it's actually okay and it's not sinful. Well, that's that's different. We're not necessarily talking about that. Um, unless... Now I'm worried about losing my faith. So we're back into this, okay, what can I do to lose my faith? Well, if I keep saying that's not sin, I don't care, whatever. The unbelief um, that sets in at some point is like, okay, I feel like I'm rambling here. Am I making sense? <laughs> You're kind of going in circles, but that's kind of the point. I know. That, that's, that's I'm trying to get my way out of this circle. It's like, uh, well, we, you know, what this, I, this is the circle. It's kind of really simple. It's like, like all theology is really simple. If you're looking to Christ as your hope, you're saved. If you're rejecting Christ and saying, I don't need him. I don't want him. God has to deal with me as I am. That's not a good state to be in. And that's when a Christian needs to walk up to you and say, you are in danger. Okay. If you are not hoping in Christ for salvation, then you are in danger of not being saved. And if they say, well, I was baptized when I was an infant, I say, great. Then return to those promises by hoping in Christ. Return to those promises by being in the word, by being in worship on Sundays. And if they say, well, I don't need that. I don't need that in my life. I just... I'm going to trust and hope my baptism and have nothing to do with God. Then I say, no, 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 that's not trusting in the promises of your baptism. Remember, baptism, justification by grace through faith is not a magic wand. Mm -hmm. Faith is required. We just went over this in church as we're reviewing Luther's small catechism on baptism, that faith is necessary for these promises to be valid for the person who's baptized. See, we don't we don't just say, well, I've got God over a barrel, so now I can do whatever <laughs> I want. No, no, no. I baptized this person, therefore God must right. save them. Has to save yeah. them because I say so. Well, yep. that's not how it works. It salvation is faith in the work of Christ for you. Now, what we want to get away from is the idea that salvation is determined by how well your faith is doing. Like, I'm really faithful, therefore I'm really saved. No, that's not it. Sometimes the worst sinner has the best hope in Christ because we know when we come before God, we know that I've got nothing in me. It's all Christ. So here's here's what I do when I go to the Lord's Supper. And this doesn't mean it's right or wrong. This is just my personal piety when I go to the Lord's just Supper. Just one way to one way to do it. Right. Yeah. When I go to the Lord's Supper, I actually pray about my unworthiness. I I approach the altar with the attitude that I am not worthy to receive the supper. And if God were to judge me according to my worthiness, this should be a meal of condemnation for me. But I pray the mercy of God in Christ that this food would be what he promises that it is, the body and blood of Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Mm. So we pray, I am not worthy to have you come under the roof of my mouth. 
but say the word, speak the word, and your servant shall be healed. Right? That mm -hmm. that we approach him acknowledging that I come with nothing but sins and unworthiness. I hope, I trust in the gospel, in the promise of God fulfilled in the death and resurrection of Jesus, that when he says, this is for you, the forgiveness of sins, that that applies even to this wretched sinner. Hmm. Now, we've already we've actually started moving into our second question from Adam in the way in which we're answering this question. <laughs> so I'm going to throw that out there now because I think this is a good time to start being more explicit about what we're actually doing here. So uh, Brad, Adam's second question was, uh, Lutherans talk about law and gospel as a schema which helps truly understand God's truth. Uh, in parentheses, almost like one word, law and gospel. It's like, boom, <laughs> there it is. I don't think I get what y'all are talking about. I wonder if he's from Texas. Which I like is that. Cool. Yeah, that's great. He typed it out, though. That's even better. I know. I don't think I get what y'all are talking about and the way you are thinking of it. Is this a Lutheran thing? Yes. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we're not the only denomination or church body that uses the term law and gospel, but how we use that term and what we mean by it is a distinctively Lutheran thing. Now, we did an episode on this called Two Words, uh, so you can always go back and listen to that one where it's an entire treatment of law and gospel and what we mean when we say law and gospel. Uh, two words, because does, does God has two words for us. He has his law and he has his gospel. Um, but Kevin, even in the way that you've been addressing this this question of, okay, I'm worried that I could lose my salvation. How do I stay saved? All that kind of stuff. You've been approaching it from a law and gospel perspective, right? That's exactly right. And the the Lutheran idea of law and gospel, which is one word, it's supposed to be two, but we've it's kind of like word and sacraments. It's one word. Yeah, um, yeah. But the reason we say law and gospel like it's one word is because um, as the Reformation was unfolding and as we were discussing theology with the, the Roman Catholics and the other non-Roman Catholic Christians out there who were discussing theological issues, one of the real treasures of Lutheran theology was that we said, hey, you guys are confusing the intent of these words of Scripture. Not all words of scripture are gospel. Some are actually law. And, and they said, what do you mean? And we said, well, here's the thing. There are parts of scripture that are gospel, meaning good news. And those are the parts that talk about what God has done for us in Christ. And mm -hmm. those are promises that we receive by grace through faith because of what Christ has done. That's the gospel stuff. There are other passages of scripture that when we hear them, they encounter us as law. They talk about what we have done or not done that has violated God's law. So there are parts of the Bible that say you are not living correctly. You are sinning. You are sinning in what you do, or perhaps you're sinning in the things that you're not doing that you should be doing. Mm-hmm. And so we say those parts of scripture, those passages of scripture encounter us as law. When I hear thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's ox. And the first thing I think of is, well, but I kind of really want Peter's ox. <laughs> it's then, a nice ox. I got to tell a you. Nice ox. It's, it's a, yeah. Then what happens is that passage has now condemned me as a sinner and reminded me and showed me that I am not holy and righteous in God's sight, that I am in fact lacking in righteousness and holiness, that I am not perfect, and that I am worthy of God's judgment. So then another passage of law comes streaming to mind, the wages of sin is death. And you think, oh no, I'm in trouble. And then you think of other passages where at the resurrection of the of the judgment, then we will stand before Jesus and give an account of all the things done in the body, whether good or evil. And they that have done good will go to eternal life and those, those that have done evil into everlasting contempt. And you think, 
oh no, I've done evil. I'm coveting <laughs> Peter's ox. <laughs> See, and, and that's going to be a delicious ox when I finally eat it. And that's the law. The law says, oh no, yeah. I'm in trouble. Look what I have done. It doesn't measure up to God's law. I'm in trouble. Okay. You know, I can help you with that coveting. I just have to put hot sauce on it. Well, then I don't want it as much, but I, I still, no. I still have kind of jealousy. You have such a fine ox. Oh, okay. Yeah. You can't escape that sin. Can you? Right. And, and, and so I think you need another word, don't you? So what happens is the law drives us to this terrifying reality that before a holy God, I stand condemned. And the gospel then is the word of God that comes and says, good news, Christ has borne your sin in his body on the cross. He has suffered the punishment that you deserve. He has reconciled you to God through his life, death, and resurrection. And now your sins are forgiven. Trust in that. Mm. See, and so... The law are all the passages that point to me as a sinner and what I'm doing. It reveals to us God's law, God's will, right? The law reveals to us God's will. And whenever we see the will of God, we're always immediately struck by the fact that I have not kept his will perfectly. I didn't actually do that. (laughs) Right. Or (laughs) I, I wasn't supposed to do that and I keep doing it. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So, yep. or um, I didn't even know I was supposed to do that. So right. I wasn't doing it and I had no idea. And That's now that I've been instructed, bad. now I'm like, oh, whoops. Yep. Okay. Yep. So the law does that. And the gospel then is always the content of the gospel is Christ and him crucified and resurrected for sinners. This is hmm. good news. Right. So this is the way that Lutherans read all of scripture. Now, let's be very honest about this and very forthright. We are not saying that the Old Testament is law and the New Testament is gospel. Which is actually the episode we were right. We were talking about in the episode where this question came up. Yeah. Right. That is and that's a common misunderstanding. So what we want to understand is that every single passage of scripture will impact the hearer, the reader, as law and gospel. I, I want to jump in here real quick because I think there's also a misunderstanding that we have, even as Lutherans within our own circles, that you can basically take the Bible and kind of chop it up and divide it out and put on the left-hand side, all these passages are law, and these passages on the right-hand side are all gospel, as if they are distinct from each other, that the the right dividing law and gospel correctly is sometimes a word that gets used means here, this is a law passage and this is a gospel passage and never the two shall meet. Like they don't mix, but we're not actually saying go through your Bible and highlight all the law passages and highlight all the gospel passages as if you can do that. You, you used, when you said your sentence, just before I started talking, you were very intentional about the words you used in that sentence. Right. <laughs> so, so say it again now that I've said what I said. Yeah. So, <laughs> so the teaching is that, that each passage of scripture will impact the hearer as law or gospel. And or sometimes, and, or, or and, and gospel, yeah. Yeah. depending on how you're reading it and what's going on in your life. And, and the greatest example of this is the statement that Jesus died for sinners. <laughs> that that can be the harshest law. Because read this in Acts chapter 2, Peter's sermon, the law of his sermon is you killed Jesus. See there the death of Christ is actually striking his hearers as law. Yep, because they say, yep. "Oh no, What must we do to be saved? See, so even the statement that, that the death of Christ can be a law statement. It can also be the gospel statement. 
Mm-hmm. So this is the point is we believe that God works through his law to impact our lives through law, which condemns us, reveals to us our sin and gospel, which then turns our eyes away from ourselves and on to Jesus and puts all of our hope in what he has done mm-hmm. to forgive us. And that's why when, when Lutherans talk about theology, we kind of have this in the back of our minds, we're always thinking law and gospel, but we're also always thinking, make sure the gospel is the focus of what we're doing and saying, because we want everyone to know the good things that God has done in Christ. Now, that means we we can't avoid the law, because without the law, there is no gospel. If there's no sin, then why did Jesus die? So we have to proclaim the law in its full effect, which is to condemn sinners. Mm-hmm. And then we make sure that we proclaim the gospel in its fullness and its richness, which is to forgive sinners and free guilty consciences that all of our hope is in Christ. Okay. So I want to put a little twist on this based on a conversation that I had uh, with our friend, Matt Whitman. We did a couple episodes with us. Oh, it's been a while now. It's been months since we talked with him. Um, But I was having a conversation with him and we were talking about law and gospel. And one of his comments was, uh, you Lutherans are so specific and and nitpicking and you're you're dividing this up. Um, He said, you know, if I were talking about what you just said, I would just say that's all part of the gospel. So I'm I'm not trying, um, I can't explain his position. I'm not trying to explain his position and how he defines this, you know, with, within his system and his beliefs. I'm not trying to do that. But it's interesting for us to be aware that when others hear us talking in this way, that they have that kind of a response of, okay, you're now you're splitting hairs that don't necessarily need to be split. Or we're saying the same thing, but we just say gospel and we mean all of those things all together. Why are why are we splitting hairs? Why does this matter to us? Because if you talk to us about this, we have a conversation. And the conversation I had with Matt, I was like, um, dude, this is like salvation itself. So we're going to split hairs. <laughs> yeah, well. And, <laughs> kind of, in a sense. Like, we're no, this is serious. And And the fact that the word gospel means good news. And when it talks about... In the scriptures, it does talk about faith in the gospel or proclaiming the gospel. And we want to be faithful to that, that the proclamation of the church is the death and resurrection of Christ. As Paul himself says, we proclaim Christ and him crucified. It's, it is moving people to see the good news of what God has done in Christ. And we don't want to muddy those waters with saying, well, God has done a lot of good stuff in Christ. Now let's talk about you also in the terms of good news. No, Mm. no, we can't do that. That's contrary to the doctrine of justification by grace through faith. The idea that we are saved solely by God's work. See, if we start getting sinners involved in gospel proclamation, what sinners do as good news, then we're going to get our salvation all messed up. And and now we're back to terrifying consciences because if I play some role in the gospel, that means my salvation is in some way contingent on me. Mm-hmm. And Peter, you know me well enough to know that if my salvation is contingent on me in any way, shape or form, I got no shot of being saved because <laughs> I'm, I'm wanting your ox. Right. Yep. See, yep. and that's the problem is whenever the sinner is given any role to play in salvation, we are now calling into question that sinner's salvation. By the way, I have so little love for you as my neighbor that I'm not even willing to give you my ox, nor exactly. am I willing to share it with you. So now we're both in deep trouble. <laughs> yep. It, and so <laughs> that's the law. <clears throat> Yeah. We don't want to make it the gospel. We want to leave the gospel to be the realm of God doing good things for us in Christ, that this is literally good news, literally mm-hmm. meaning what the word means, gospel. Gospel means good news. Yeah. And th- this is when I'm listening to a sermon uh, in church from my pastor, or even any pastor, this is actually one of the things I'm listening for. 
I'm listening for hearing the law. Am, am I a sinner? How have I sinned? You know, tell me that in the sermon, you know, strike me down, smash me with that hammer, and then point me to Christ as the Savior, as the solution for that sin. So I want to hear both of those things in a sermon. This this is very often where some people will first encounter this idea of law and gospel as Lutherans talk about it, because we talk about it in the context of our sermons, whether it's in a church service, chapel service, wherever it is, law and gospel preaching is kind of like our bread and butter. So which one's, we the make, law and which one's the gospel in bread and butter? We make our confirmands take sermon notes, yep. right? And they have to identify the law and the gospel in the sermon. Yeah. And I've I've actually got a friend who has a a teenage child who uh is taking sermon notes without requirements because they're so intrigued to make sure they get the law and the gospel written down in the sermon. And it's great because they'll just sit there and take notes. They walk up to the pastor and be like, I found like five things of law and only like one thing of gospel. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, the gospel is really sweet. So I know I'm forgiven, right? but But oh man, (laughs) but that's kind of fun. And if you, um, as you prepare to listen to a sermon, this is a really good way to listen to it is what am I hearing in this that is actually highlighting my sinfulness Mm -hmm. that is highlighting where I'm falling short. What in this sermon is telling me what God requires or God desires of me. That's the law. And then you say, now what am I hearing that makes me rejoice in what God has done for me in Christ? So when my son had to do his sermon notes for the, the first time, he had just begun confirmation um, and I think fifth grade, because we started early confirmation here at our church. And I looked at his sermon notes afterwards and the law and gospel, he was like, none. It's like, wait, <laughs> what? I was like, well, you didn't hear? He's like, well, no, pastor never said law right. and he never said the word gospel. So right. there was no law and gospel in this. I was like, oh, okay, let's review. <laughs> a little literal now. <laughs> this, this, yeah. <laughs> Does. It's it's not necessarily a good thing for the pastor to say. Now here's the law. Now well, here's the gospel. It can and, be good, and but that's that <laughs> goes back to what we we're saying before: is that we don't control this. Yeah, I yep. can't decide to speak a word of law to you, and then a word of gospel to you. Yeah, this is actually something that the Holy Spirit does, and. This is a bigger topic that we don't have time to get into, but but even the way that the law affects a sinner, we can't control that. So we believe there are three ways that the law affects a sinner. The first way is that it terrifies you and stops you from doing evil out of fear of punishment. The second way is that it it shows you how much of a sinner you are. And the third way is that it teaches you how to live in thanksgiving in response to God's love for you in Christ. Now, the problem is I can't control how the law hits you. Right. I can't control. I can't say, well, I'm now going to speak to you a law that will show you how to live a life of thankfulness in Christ. And it won't do anything else. And it, it won't will only do the other do two. Yeah. I can't do that. Gonna do that. That's yeah. actually the Holy Spirit's work. And so this is why even when we're trying to help someone learn to live a sanctified and holy life in Christ and say, hey, this is God's will for you in Christ. You don't have to do this to be saved. This is just how we get to live because we're freed in Christ. Even that can be heard as a law that condemns and reminds me that I'm a sinner and have no hope for salvation in myself. Mm -hmm. So even when we teach that, we want to make sure that we always proclaim Christ. We always proclaim that between you and God, the measure is not your ability to live out your sanctified life, but the measure between you and God is the accomplished, finished work of Christ on the cross. Yep. Okay. We got two questions here, Kevin, and I'm going to leave it up to you which one you want to handle in our last few minutes here. We have a question about what it means for God to destroy the soul in hell. Or, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Two really easy ones, no problem, total softballs. 
Which the, one do you want yeah. to take? <laughs> um, they're both. Let's let's just say this: they're both extremely good questions. Yeah, they're fantastic um, questions. I love it. This, this is what we want. People are reading the scriptures and saying, "Huh, I don't know if I get this one." Well, and both of them come with additional Bible verses. So right. Debbie, who asked, Debbie actually asked both questions, and it's like, okay, I'm looking in Scripture, and here's what it says. Help me work through this, which is awesome. <laughs> okay, so the first thing is. Let's let's take the one about destruction. Okay. What does it mean for God to destroy the soul in hell? Um, the Bible verse we're looking at is Matthew ten twenty eight. You want to read that, Peter? Yeah, and do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Okay, and then the the question says, I looked it up on Google, <laughs> and one of the things that destroys destroy can mean is to put an end to the existence of something or someone, something like By that. By damaging or attacking it. Right. Or a similar word to annihilate, wipe out, obliterate, wipe off the face of the earth. Okay. And that's very helpful. And the English word destroy can certainly mean that. And the Greek word in this passage can also mean that. However, the Greek word in this passage can also mean to simply die. Hmm. So... If you go back to, or to be destroyed in some non-annihilation way. So if you go back to Matthew chapter five, this is the, this is the best thing to do is you want to find. Go back to Matthew five. Yeah. Okay. You want to find a place in the same book of the Bible where the author uses the word to see if you can establish the way that the author uses the word. Ah. Okay. So Google is not wrong, but Google doesn't necessarily understand how Matthew is using the word. So if you go back to Matthew 5, verses 29 and 30, you have the exact same Greek word used twice, but they're not translated destroy. Ooh. Yeah. Interesting, isn't it? In Matthew 5, 29, it says this, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. That's always a fun verse. (laughs) For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. Now, the weird thing is that second second sentence, for it is better, it actually says, for to you, it is better in order that or that destroyed one of your members. So where it says that lose one of your members, the Greek word is actually destroy. Now, it does not mean that if you pluck out your eye, it ceases to exist or that it's annihilated. It actually means that it's destroyed as in not useful to you, no longer a functioning eye because you've torn it out and thrown it away. Mm. Right? Yeah. So then if you go to the next verse, and if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it out cut it off and throw it away for it's better to lose one of their exact same uses there. Right. Yep. Parallel phrases. So if you cut off your hand and throw it away, it doesn't cease to exist. And I'm not trying to be gross here, but if you cut off your hand and throw it away, it'll actually just decay like a body in the ground. It doesn't cease to exist. And the next verse says, whoever sends his wife away, does that have any? No, different words. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Thankfully. Okay. So then in Matthew 8, 25, is another instance of the same Greek word destroy. Matthew 8, 25. And right. this is, what story is this? Um, this is the disciples. Well, Peter's mother-in-law was just healed. The leper was healed. Right. This oh, is, the disciples are worried about their th- stuff. and They're worried living. about dying. Yeah, burying their father. No, yep, yep. no, no. This is them stilling the storm. This is Jesus stilling the storm. Okay, so there. Yeah, Matthew eight twenty five. Okay. Well, if one guy wants to go back and bury his father. Yeah, but that's not where the quote is from. Oh, so this is I, in, that's right before the storm. My bad. Okay. Yeah, yes. So at eight twenty five, Jesus calms the storm, and what's happening is there's all kind of winds and waves, and the and the boat is getting swamped, and Jesus is asleep, and they wake him up, and they say, "Save us, Lord, for we are perishing." But yeah. the word in Greek is the exact same word as in 1028. So you could translate it. We are being destroyed. 
Now, it's interesting. Okay. I've got the NASB, and it's used perishing for all of these so far. Exactly. 1028, so, see if it's consistent. So oh, the, it switches to destroy. In that yeah. One. <laughs> so this is the issue, is the Greek word that's translated destroyed here can simply mean to perish or to be thrown away and to be discarded. It doesn't mean necessarily in every instance that the thing ceases to exist. Hmm. Okay, because the disciples are so, are not worried about no longer existing. They're not Just saying the wind and waves are going to make us no longer exist. They're saying <laughs> we're afraid we're going to die. And mm. and my point is, the Greek word is, that Matthew uses is the same one that's in 20, ten twenty eight. So that so that that was a long way to say that the actual Greek word does not necessarily mean to put it into the existence of something or to wipe it out and annihilate it. It basically means they're going to die and go to hell. In tw- 1028, not in 825. Right. Aren't probably word Sorry, on. yes. I, I jumped ahead because yes. I'm reading 1028 so, again. <laughs> so rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell does not mean to annihilate the body and soul at hell. It means to cast it off in punishment and that it exists in eternal punishment, which which is great, be, not great, but but <laughs> good reading of scripture. No, because, no, no, we went through law and gospel, Kevin. Right, that's, that's not law. good. That's, that's law. law. <laughs> but then Debbie does a great job of going to Isaiah sixty six, where it says, "For their worm shall not die, their fire shall not be quenched, and they shall be an abhorrence, abhorrence to all flesh." Okay, so this is right. The the punishment of hell does not end mm. sine fine without end. Okay. That's the classical doctrine. So it's very good observation here. Very good question. Jesus is not saying that, that the body and soul will be annihilated in hell. No, it means it, it'll be cast into hell for eternal punishment. As the other text that you have cited Isaiah 66 and Revelation 20 both affirm. Now, there is a wrong doctrine called annihilationism. Right. Is this one of the passages they use to justify that? Um, it could be. It's it's There aren't really any passages necessarily to justify it because the scriptures are pretty clear that there's a resurrection of both the just and the unjust. Mm-hmm. And those things will last forever. It's more the fear of a loving God punishing eternally and that doesn't seem consistent that people kind of make this up so we got we got to close here but the the next question is angels and humans are they immortal and the answer is and this is going to be weird yes and no (laughs) yeah because immortal is not a biblical word well right in that sense well it is in first corinthians 15 what was sown in mortality is raised in immortality so yeah yeah, it's there but but even there notice that it's immortal in one direction Hmm. right we don't want to have the immortality of the soul which means our souls have existed for all of eternity that's not our biblical doctrine there was a day when you didn't exist but now from now on, you will eternally exist. The, the fact that there was a day I didn't exist is one of the things that helps me know that I'm not God. Exactly. That's one of your <laughs> non-God qualities. Yep. Not that you have a lot of those, just a couple. Better. <laughs> oh, no, I have plenty of non-God qualities. Oh, right, right, there, there's right. plenty of those. Yeah. So so I hope that helps. Um, this is why... The law is so powerful and the gospel is so important because this is not some kind of short term issue where it's like, well, God's kind of upset with you. You don't want that to be the case. No, the law talks about eternal punishment. And that is a horrifying idea. And nobody rejoices in that for themselves or for anybody else. This is just a horrible thought that anybody would have to suffer for all of eternity. But that's exactly what our sins deserve, which is why the gospel is what we cling to with our hope, all of our hope that God in Christ has given to you forgiveness of your sins and that forgiveness lasts for eternity 
and all those who have faith in Christ Jesus will live in the presence of God, in paradise, in bliss, forever with him because of the work of Christ. So all sinners, repent and put your hope in Christ, for there is eternal life. Amen. And that is the crucial conversation. Do you guys have questions? You know how to get them to us. And we'll see you next time. See ya.